Thanks, Jess, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Well, when Jess asked me to frame this next bit around how important the public domain is to libraries, the first thing that sort of got into my head was really how often probably do we not hear the term public domain. It's certainly a term that I grew up with, uh, I'm familiar with, and when I, that sort of came into my mind again this morning when we saw those photos from Julia of young people demonstrating on the streets around um, Article 13, and I thought I should have asked my 25-year-old and my 22-year-old what they think the public domain is, and I just wonder if that's a challenge for us in terms of um, you think of the internet maybe as the public domain. Well, it's not. There is material in the public domain. There is material that is protected by a whole lot of other rights. So maybe we need to, in, in trying to celebrate and underscore the importance of the public domain, is find another way to frame that description and frame that conversation so that we can put it back into focus. I think... Um, you know, for libraries, I think libraries are about the public domain fundamentally. The public domain there is, from our perspective, is supporting the public interest, the public good. It's very much around our core role of um, uh, collecting, preserving, making accessible knowledge, information, cultural expression, ideas, and the public domain is inextricably linked with that. And I think as librarians, if we didn't have that rich corpus of material there um, on which to base some of our practice that we would struggle. But of course, that public domain is also there for creators, and a lot of what libraries do is help creators, researchers, authors, people that do their own personal research. We connect them with material in the public domain and copyrighted material um, for the creation, for something new, for another purpose. So that ecosystem that we were talking about this morning around um, authors, librarians, publishers, the public domain is a really important part of that as well. Now, Jess has referenced and Emma referenced the recent um, legislative changes that have meant from the 1st of January this year, millions, and that is exactly right, millions of documents, and not just documents, but a whole lot of material, photographs, um, sound, all sorts of things uh, will be coming into the public domain. And of course, a lot of this happened on the 1st of January. Um, and that's after a bit of a drought, really, because we had the copyright term extension in the mid-2000s, in the mid-noughties. And of course, at least in Australia, there hasn't been a lot of material that's made its way into the public domain. So it's certainly it's worth celebrating. But it didn't happen by itself. And uh, I, we've already had a nod today to Alia and Sue McCarricka, but um, unfortunately, she's not here. I would give another nod. But for those of you not in the library sector, in 2015, in an act of civil disobedience, librarians and archivists um, went searching for recipes in our, particularly our unpublished collections that were then, of course, at that time, covered by perpetual copyright. And as librarians and archivists love to do, we cooked, we had morning teas, we had celebrations, but we made things from these recipes. So one beautiful find was a recipe for carrot marmalade from one of Captain Cook's diaries, which astoundingly and absurdly was still in copyright because it was in a perpetual copyright situation. So we had a fabulous campaign um, aided by Twitter and um, at one stage it was um, trending as number one and we had more than uh, 10 million Twitter impressions and I don't know an awful lot about Twitter but that's a pretty impressive number and 1,500 tweets. And I think just the nonsensical nature of having some of this material in perpetual copyright. We got our point across um, and we were really, really pleased that government responded and rights holders also uh, realised that actually this was a bit silly. So it was one of those, in a way, uh, legislative reforms that actually makes a great deal of sense um, and so it happened and so there's many people to thank for that. Of course, um, now the, the big challenge begins because we have all this material and whilst it's fair to say that we libraries were making, libraries and archives and other collecting institutions 
had been digitising some of this material and making it available on a risk basis. Um, we now actually have no excuse, except for the millions of dollars it will cost us to digitise all this material and make it available. Um, but that's one of the challenges, again, about the internet. People expect that that material is there. But there's just a couple of things I'd like to highlight about why it's uh, so important and uh, why we are so pleased. One of the things that I think is really, really important, if you look at the published record of Australia, it's predominantly a colonial voice. It's predominantly a white Anglo-Saxon voice uh, in publishing. These unpublished materials, I know across all of the organisations, IATSIS, um, archives that we have around the country, national and state libraries, there are so many other diverse voices in that unpublished material and freeing it up from um, having copyright restrictions enables us to make those voices more readily available. For Aboriginal and in other Indigenous people, it means it's easier for them to find if we can digitise it. There are, of course, other complications and we've just touched on them around traditional knowledge protection and the interface between those systems, but at least that material will be much more visible, much more easier for people um, to, to access. The other thing that I'd just raise is um, probably more of a concern um, is um, how some of this material in the public domain is now being taken and put out of the public domain through um, digital object identifiers. Um, so public domain material is copied, as it can be, by um, other organisations, and here I'm particularly thinking around some d database vendors, etc. And of course, in using um, the DOI, it becomes the authoritative version of an article. It gets locked behind a paywall. So you've gone from something that's in the public domain, and recent example that was quoted at a conference that I was at was one of Charles Darwin's original papers. Um, out of copyright, but it's been given a DOI, that becomes the official version for citing in academic papers, goes behind a paywall. So on the one hand, we're unlocking um, the public domain, making these things available, but it gets reworked as, you know, and, and legally, there's nothing legally that prevents that. But I think that's just a little um, salutary lesson that we're going to have to keep in our head, particularly as librarians, where, you know, commitment to open access to making this material available in the public domain is just to watch what happens to it after that. So that's all I wanted to say. We are really, really pleased. We'd like to thank everyone involved in Cooking for Copyright, the department and government for listening, and also our partners um, in the rights holders. You know, I think this was, these were really sensible, in a way, no-brainer um, uh, legislative changes, and I think that's really positive um, from, and wonderful new content released this year. Thank you.